So one of the things that we talked about at the beginning and have sort of seen throughout is that the book of Isaiah, even the first part, is not a uniform whole. Uh, parts written in different times of Isaiah's life, uh, some parts that we might say are later editions from the time of Josiah. One of the big chunks that is almost always understood as being considerably later, uh, not just a little bit later, but much later, is chapters 24 through 27, uh, which are very different in character and in referent uh, to the rest of, of First Isaiah, and which are often known as the apocalypse of Isaiah, which immediately puts us in mind of much, much later literature. Now, if anybody knows whether something is apocalyptic <laughs> or not, it's you. So let me ask you, is Isaiah 24 through 27 apocalyptic literature? No, it is definitely not an apocalypse. How because do you know? <laughs> an apocalypse is a revelation. Now, okay, this is a name that comes from the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. The second half of the book of Daniel is really the only good example of it in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And then there is a lot of literature that didn't make it into the canon. Books attributed to Enoch and Ezra and Baruch and so forth. But they're all revelations. Now, usually some kind of visual form. Mm -hmm. And then an angel has to explain it. Right. So you don't get that frame mm -hmm. here. And, uh, you know, here, what you have are oracles. But if, from if, a formal this, point if of view. this text yeah. were <coughs> framed that way, well, then, then the it, content is not so dissimilar, is now, it? The, the main reason why people have thought of this as an apocalypse is because of the imagery, and it's imagery of cosmic destruction. This is the beginning of the end of the world. You know, that the earth shivers and shakes and is cracking and about to split open. So it's, it's language that uh, evokes cosmic destruction. Right. And also, they use a lot of old mythology to do it, which is also true of Daniel and, and Revelation. And Revelation. <laughs> Now, to my mind, one of the big tests of how apocalyptic this is, mm -hmm. is whether it posits a resurrection. That, to my mind, is one of the great divisions between the apocalyptic literature and the older prophetic literature. That in the book of Daniel, at the end, you know, you have a clear reference to the resurrection of the dead mm -hmm. and a judgment of the dead. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of disputed passages here. And there are people who would read it that way. Now, I don't. But, right. but yeah. so what then about a passage like Ezekiel, which seems to have resurrection, well, you see, I but take, you would never call it I, I take it that actually what you have here is much more like what we have in, in Ezekiel. Uh, but Ezekiel, you see, adds, these bones are the whole house of Israel. So he tells you very directly I'm using this language metaphorically. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting because he's obviously familiar with the idea of resurrection. Right. Some people think he may have gotten that from the Persians, which would mean he'd have had to have lived a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but at the same time, he is clearly not talking about actual people coming back to life. Right. And you think that's true here also. And that's what I think is true here. We can look at the passage here. It's in chapter 26. Um, and uh, the way it's set up, uh, the, it's contrasting two kinds. O Lord our God, uh, other lords besides you have ruled over us, but we acknowledge your name alone. The dead do not live. This is verse 14. Shades do not arise, because you have punished them and destroyed them. But you have increased the nation, O Lord. You have glorified and enlarged all the borders of the land. And then a little bit further down it says, Your dead shall live. Their corpses shall rise. O dwellers in the dust, the dust is Sheol. Mm -hmm. uh, awake and sing for joy. Your dew is a radiant dew, and the earth will give birth to those long dead. Now, I take it there that the contrast is between two people, the Babylonians on the one hand, mm -hmm. and the 
Israelites or Judeans on the other. And that when he says, your dead shall live, he's used saying that the same way Ezekiel talked about so, the valley full of dry So bones. we're talking about a restoration of the uh, nation of rather the nation. than resurrection of people. That's how I read it. But now there are plenty of people who will say, no, this, this is actual resurrection. So are you then putting this section of First Isaiah in the Babylonian period, the post-Babylonian? How far are you willing to go with this? How late is late? You're not putting it into the Daniel apocalypse period. No, I'm not putting it into the Daniel uh, period. I'm putting it probably in the Persian period. Mm -hmm. A big question in it is, it's, a lot of it is about the destruction of a city, the city of chaos. Right. And the question is, what is that city? And you know, I would guess, but it's really a guess, that it's Babylon. Yeah. Because Babylon was destroyed by the, the Persians, not by Cyrus originally, but by Darius, so in the fifth century. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, a general, it's a fairly good general rule that when uh, in the Bible they talk about non-Israelite cities, it's almost always either Nineveh or Babylon. Right, like those are the yeah. those are the two. Right, those are the the giants yeah. the giant cities that loomed large in the Israelite imagination, know, depending on when. Their knowledge of geography wasn't all that good. <laughs> so they, they, they didn't know too many others. Right, but so I mean, if it is the destruction of Babylon, that would definitely put it down into that period. Mm -hmm. But now, it's, it just recently, in fact, uh, uh, an Old Testament professor at Fuller Seminary, Christopher Hayes wrote a book arguing that this is just, these are authentic oracles of Isaiah in the 8th century. And in that, he was following his teacher at Emory, John Hayes, mm -hmm. who had argued this. Uh, the reason most of us don't believe that is just the style. And what you find in a lot of the later prophetic books is that you get more generalized oracles of kind of cosmic destruction, final confrontation with God, lacking historical specifics. Yeah, one of the things that we've talked about so much in the book of Isaiah is just how rooted in the historical yeah, events of the time. That's right. It's political, <coughs> it's contemporary, uh, it's looking at uh, Assyria, it's talking to individual kings, it's talking about events like the Syro-Ephraimite uh, yeah. war, uh, even when Isaiah is doing oracles against the nations, right, many of them are also rooted in the historical moment. And he names names. Almost never does Isaiah start talking, first Isaiah, start talking about the world as a whole. Right. Right? He's incredibly focused on, on Israel, on Judah, on Jerusalem, on the Davidic line, and about how that's going to survive in this particular moment. Yeah. This is, it's, it's just very out of character. It is, but it's very characteristic of the later prophetic books. Mm -hmm. Think, for example, of the, the judgment in the Valley of Jehoshaphat in, in Joel. Mm -hmm. um, again, what is this? <laughs> and, you know, it's a confrontation with all of the Gentile world, or mm -hmm. Gog of the land of Magog. Yeah. Now, the name may have come from Gyges of Lydia, but he had no quarrel with the Jews. Right. Uh, uh, why are they picking on him? Yeah. It's, it's just foreigners are bad. Mm -hmm. It's xenophobic. And uh, understandably so, you know, in times when they had been subject to a series of empires and life was bad in, in Judah, you get this wish to cosmic destruction. And one of, one of the uh, nice touches in these chapters is you know, the world will crack, the world will fall apart, but Zion alone will be exalted. So the rest of the world may go down in smoke, but Zion will still be standing there. You, you can see how these chapters found their way into the book of Isaiah, right? Yeah. As, assuming they weren't written for this context, but existed in some uh, sort of independent form elsewhere. Yeah, uh, you it, know, it's Zion centered. It, it, it fits. It fits the profile. It fits the it. profile. <laughs> yeah. um, one of the things you mentioned earlier on was the uh, use of older mythological yes. tropes, 
uh, which you know is, is a funny thing to think about as uh, later texts really more consistently, in a sense, call on what we think of as very the very old uh, traditions. Um, yeah. Now, it specifically in this case, uh, and I love this passage. It's in chapter twenty-five. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines. They weren't looking forward to a spiritual afterlife. <laughs> uh, and he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples. He will swallow up death forever. Now, the full force of that line really only became apparent when they found the text that you garret. Uh, in Syria, found mm -hmm. them in 1929, and up to this we only knew of the god Baal and of Canaanite religion from the things that were said about it in the Bible. Most of which are nasty and wrong. Most of which are nasty <laughs> and wrong, exactly. And now we had some of their own texts. Right, and Incl one, including epic, I mean lengthy yes. epic, epic narratives. And, and one of these concerns a struggle between the god Baal and death. Right, the death god personified. and. Death at one point opens its mouth with one lip to earth and one lip to heaven, and Baal goes down into him like an olive cake. Mm -hmm. In other words, death swallows Baal. So what the prophet was doing here was saying that will be reversed. Yeah. Yahweh now takes the place of Baal as the god of life, yeah. and he will swallow up death. Now, this is not, I think, at all speaking of resurrection in this passage. Right. It is talking about a change in the conditions of human existence. And the other touch also indebted to the old Canaanite myth is in chapter 27, verse 1. On that day, the Lord with his cruel and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan the fleeing serpent, Leviathan the twisting serpent, and he will kill the dragon that is in the sea. I mean, this is as old as it as it gets, as really, it gets. and and also yeah. almost pan ancient Near Eastern, right? The yeah. the deities fight with the sea. We see it in Mesopotamian mythology, yeah. um, <clears throat> with you know the uh, the creation myth, with the destruction of Tiamat, which then appears in Genesis one in the Bible in an altered form, and yeah. we see it in Canaanite myth. And you know, we get allusions to it in the Bible. We get one in the book of Job, for mm -hmm. example, and we get one in Isaiah chapter 51. Wasn't a Jew who slew the dragon. But in all those other places, the dragon is supposed to have been killed a long time ago. This was part of the work of creation. Mm -hmm. What you get here is the endzeit, yeah. the, uh, the projection of this into the future. Uh, one of the, the great books on this stuff was by Hermann Gunkel, a German scholar at the end of the 19th century, and he coined the phrase that Endzeit liked Urzeit. Mm -hmm. The end time is like the primeval time. Yeah. It becomes cyclical. Right. The world will have to be recreated. Right. Uncre that's, uncreated and, and then recreated. And then that's what gets picked up in Daniel and Revelation, and that's what makes the connection here. Right. Though you're, yes. though you still don't want to make this part of that same no, genre. No, but you can see that um, you know it's moving in that direction, in a way. Now, people also point out that this kind of prophecy goes with the the canonization of the literature, which is a tendency to take the literature out of its own context mm -hmm. and make it into, you know, something that's speaking about the end of the world. Yeah. And that's something that happens a lot in the Second Temple period right. and in the, the editing of the prophetic books. And there's a question, right? What do we do yeah. with an Isaiah who is so firmly rooted in his time and place? Right? How do we make that text speak to yeah. everybody <laughs> thereafter? And adapting some of its themes and building on it and situating it in, a, in this broader conversation is, is one of the ways that I think that that happens. It is. Although I think there was another way that it might have been done, and that's by paying more attention to the specifics and looking for analogies, which I think is actually a better way of bringing the material to life. But that's generally not what happened in the way the books were edited. And what actually happened with the book of Isaiah was somebody kept writing 
And so we have the second Isaiah is doing so much of that work uh, yeah. of, extending of extending first Isaiah yeah. into, uh, into history.